Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. Today's webinar is uh, part of the webinar series Tuesday, uh, Tuesday uh, Lunch with Rita. Uh, these are webinar series organized by the European Reference Network Rita to discuss specific immunology and rheumatology topics. They are organized first Tuesday each month. Um, and today we have an excellent speaker. First, we would like to apologize for having a few minutes delay. Uh, we had some technical difficulties, which hopefully uh, will be uh, solved very soon. And uh, I will, uh, I'm Tadeo Chin, pediatric rheumatologist, immunologist from Ljubljana, Slovenia. Uh, and I will pass the microphone to my co-chair, uh, Michael, to introduce himself and our speaker today. Please, Michael. Hi, everybody. Welcome uh, to this webinar. Thank you, today for the introductory words. Um, today, we would like to um, introduce our speaker, Stefan Ehl from Freiburg. Um, I don't think he needs that much introduction. I will still start uh, by saying that he's a real expert in um, primary immunodeficiency diseases. And he will today um, talk to us about rare disorders in the borderline between primary immunodeficiencies and autoimmunity. And um, while we are still experiencing some connection problems, I can say that he's currently affiliated with the University of Freiburg, where, is the, where he is the director of the Institute for Immunodeficiency um, and runs a large diagnostic as well as experimental um, lab focused on T-cell immunodeficiencies. Thanks for your patience. Sorry for that. So um, just to start with um, my disclosures, and um, I would like to, um, to thank um, Michael and Tajay for, um, for inviting me to this presentation. Um, and I, would, uh, I wasn't really sure what to expect. Um, Initially, um, I was I was contacted by Alexandre Velo, and um, so I was expecting a more rheumatology-oriented uh, audience, uh, and I'm not sure what. For that reason, to start with a case that um, that uh, is dedicated to the rheumatologists in the audience, to just to get you tuned to the topic. So um, this is about an 11-month-old girl with polyarthritis. Um, the girl actually started with her uh, clinical manifestation at the age of four months when she had swelling, redness, pain uh, and functional deficit in hands and feet. Small and large joints were affected and she had significant morning stiffness. She was ana negative, rumor factor negative and had quite a poor response to prednisone, um, methylprednisone pulses and methotrexate. You can see some of, uh, of the clinical pictures here in the uh, in the slide. Now, in addition to this, um, lymph adenopathy was noted, um, cervical, axillary, and inguinal. And the family history was notable for alopecia in her mother, which occurred at um, eight years of age, and Hashimoto thyroiditis at the age of 12. The mother also had um, eczema. So we did genetics um, on this girl and uh, found a maternally inherited mutation in CTLA-4. Now CTLA-4, as you know, um, is an inhibitory receptor on T cells, particularly regulatory T cells, that has an increased um, affinity um, to the, its ligands CD80 and 86 compared to CD28. And it is thus able to inhibit co-simulatory signals um, to T cells. In the absence of, or in hapless insufficiency of CTLA-4 leads to increased T cell activation, and um, this causes a systemic polyautoimmune disorder. Now, um, interestingly, in this disease, as you are well aware of, um, abatacept um, offers an opportunity for targeted therapy, because this drug um, can actually competitively bind to CD80 and 86, and thereby also prevent um, its stimulatory ligation to CD28. So um, uh, essentially, um, 
there, there's a lot of hope, of course, um, that this will uh, then revert the clinical cause of this child. And, um, well, as an immunologist, um, it's satisfying to be able to offer um, targeted therapy. So um, the arrogant uh, immunologist that comes on the rheumatology ward says, well, do the genetics, identify the disease, and then use targeted therapy. Problem solved. Is this really the case? I'll come back to that case later, um, and you will see why I put this um, so, um, so prominently here. Now let's um, open up um, the larger scale from this individual case report. Um, autoimmunity, um, as has evolved in recent years, but has been known from the beginning essentially, is an important presenting symptom in primary immunodeficiencies. And these are now data from the EZ registry that focus on um, primary immunodeficiencies or inborn errors of immunity, but excludes autoinflammatory diseases because the EZ registry is just not complete in this area. Now, in 2021, Julian Thalhammer did an analysis where he looked at 16,486 patients that were registered and looked um, very simply at the initial clinical manifestations in these, uh, in these patient histories. So why did they first consult a physician? And um, as you can see, infections uh, are the primary cause of seeking medical attention for these patients. But equally, or at, at least almost a quarter of the patients um, present with uh, immune dysregulation, either in isolation so as a single um, primary manifestation or in combination with infectious diseases. So it's a relevant manifestation. And um, we have for some years an interest in what we call autoimmune lymphoproliferative primary immune deficiencies, diseases in which uh, autoimmunity is combined with lymphoproliferative manifestations. And the signature disease, of course, um, is autoimmune lymphoproliferative syndromes, um, mutations in the FAST gene. But as you know, um, a number of additional diseases that cause this phenotype are sometimes, uh, and I hate this term, are called Alps-like diseases, have been molecularly defined. And um, this is an area of intensive um, uh, study. So we have um, some years ago um, started in 2010, I think, um, to systematically look at these uh, patients in a pediatric population. And um, this is a summary of, uh, of the study as it stands at the moment. So we include pediatric patients that are referred for elevation, evaluation of, of ALPS. And here we have made a cutoff at the age of 18 so um, we have um, focused on pediatric patients. And um, in this cohort, we now have around 430 patients that can be uh, subgrouped in certain um, uh, or defined clinical presentations. Um, the largest group that presents with lymphoproliferation and autoimmune cytopenia. Another group uh, that presents with lymphoproliferation and another sign of PIT and I will um, explain to you in a minute. And then a few smaller groups that are also referred for elevation of ALPS because of autoimmune cytopenia, either uh, by B autoimmune cytopenia or autoimmune cytopenia and sign of PID. And this sign of PID and in the study can be um, autoimmune or inflammatory manifestations, infections, a family history, um, syndromal manifestations, lab abnormalities or consanguinity. And most of the patients have not only one sign of PID, but several, um, illustrating also the disease burden in this cohort. So if we look at these patients that, um, that have been referred for ALPS evaluation, and um, that is mainly a lymphoproliferative autoimmune um, cohort, and look at their um, genetic uh, diagnosis, um, this is essentially what we, what we find. So the largest group are patients with autoimmune lymphoproliferative syndrome, 71 uh, patients here. 
Then we have a group um, of diseases that are mostly autosomal dominant, um, autoimmune proliferative primary immunodeficiencies, including genetic disorders of the JAK-STAT pathway, CTLA4, LRBA, um, APDS1 and 2, RAS-associated diseases, and NF-kappa B signaling associated diseases. This is the second uh, largest group with 54 patients. Um, restricting um, a quarter of these patients to six immunological pathways involved in immune cell signaling. There are other defined PIDs that are listed here um, that uh, can, of course, make this phenotype. And uh, we are all aware that any combined immune deficiency in some situation um, can present as a lymphoproliferative disease with autoimmune manifestations. So here you will find a big um, diversity, but these are individuals really, rather than the groups of patients that we have seen here. Some patients have other diagnoses as listed here. And then we have a group of patients that were sequenced um, to a significant depth in, um, up to whole genome sequencing, but at least a large PID panel, um, but where no diagnosis could be found um, that is currently accepted as a clinical diagnosis. Of course, there's some research going on here. And this is also what I would like to focus um, on for the rest of my talk. And then there's a group of patients where genetics was not considered by the treating physician um, to an extent that would really allow to classify these patients as, as no diagnosis so far. Good, so um, as a summary of these introductory notes, um, I would like to say that, um, or that a large spectrum of inborn errors of immunity and also some other more clinically defined diseases present with lymphoproliferation and autoimmunity in childhood. There are six key signaling pathways that are predominantly infected in these patients, um, but applying current genetic methods, um, at least one third of the patients that have been uh, thoroughly investigated still remain without molecular diagnosis. And this is, um, of course, a challenge. And uh, one can put up the hypothesis that most of these autoimmune proliferative patients have an underlying a genetic diagnosis. You just have to look deep enough. But it's also possible that this is not all genetics. And um, based on my experience in the last years, also with intensive um, hunting for somatic variants and um, uh, and using whole genome uh, approaches, uh, I'm quite convinced that, that not all of this, uh, these phenotypes can be explained by simple monogenetic causes. I will just close up by going back to the patient, because with that promise of targeted therapy, of course, we started a bathyset in that girl, but had actually a, a poor response. So there was no uh, improvement of the arthritis, uh, even when we uh, shortened the interval. We then started with rituximab um, four times weekly, then monthly, and had a moderate response, I must say, and eventually decided in this uh, young girl who was really pain uh, stri uh, stricken and um, to perform allogeneic transplantation. She received um, uh, a 10 out of 10 uh, graft and was really pain free with the start of conditioning, significantly improved mobility. And on day 30, she, um, she had full chimerism. However, she started with a tolerance reconstitution um, at day uh, 100 when it was first noticed and eventually fully rejected the graph. Nevertheless, she is currently one year after hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. She is free of symptoms and she is under careful monitoring. So, um, and this brings me to my conclusion, uh, and I think also to a modest conclusion. Um, but I, what I want to give you um, uh, with this is that autoimmunity, if it comes with something else, uh, and the big lymph nodes, the family history, uh, the autoimmunity in several um, compartments uh, are important clues, look for the something else and look repeatedly. And if you do the genetics, don't only think of germline mutations, think of somatic mutations. 
But even if you do that, um, you will find a diagnosis in less than 50% of the patients, no matter how convincing the phenotype. I haven't shown you the data, but among these ALPID patients who did not get a diagnosis, the disease burden, the heterogeneity of the autoimmunity, the immune phenotypes do not differ at all from those that received a diagnosis. So try to identify the disease, but um, it can still take years to make a convincing link between the mutation and the disease. And we cannot work up every patient uh, as we did here uh, for, for this individual. And finally, targeted therapies are, of course, in all um, minds, but they are not always the solution. Um, and um, we should extend this to hematopoietic stem cell transplantation because obviously, uh, as you are all aware, um, this is also not always um, an easy uh, path. And uh, for this girl, we are now in a situation where we have a reset immune system uh, that is nevertheless CTLA4 deficient. And um, at the moment, um, we are uh, pursuing a watch and wait strategy because we are well aware that some of these individuals uh, may stay oligo or even asymptomatic for many years. So that's what I wanted to say. I want to thank Sarah Grün. She's uh, the key uh, person in the uh, STAT-5 project. And of course, Richard Morigel, who provided us with these, uh, with these mice to the experiments. Klaus Schwarz, who was involved in the genetics and finding the somatic mutation. And of course, the whole infrastructure that we have here to uh, try to work out these uh, patients from the biobank to the advanced diagnostic unit, the immunology clinic, uh, and also the mouse group um, that all work together. So um, thanks to you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Um, thank you very much for the presentation, for the uh, answers to excellent questions. It really somehow reflects the, you know, the, our clinical practice that we face every day and that uh, some patients do not uh, fit into the textbooks. Uh, and uh, it shows how the medical science in this field is rapidly evolving. Um, I will pass to my co-chair to finish the webinar. And once again, we are uh, apologizing for the technical difficulties at the beginning. Please, Michael. Yes, thank you very much. My um, only um, obligation is to thank Stefan again for this excellent presentation. Uh, it was perfect and it stimulated a large um, stimulation uh, disc discussion between non immunodeficiency physicians and immunodeficiency physicians, which is exactly what Rita should be about. And with this, I can only close the session and remind you that every first Thursday, uh, Tuesday, sorry, Tuesday of the month, uh, we have this series of Tuesday Lunch with Rita webinars. So the next one will be at the beginning of March. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.